Hello and welcome to our worship service for January 31st, 2021. My name is Bill Grace. I'm the minister here at St. Luke's Presbyterian Church, Oshawa. Welcome as we set aside this time for worship. If you are with us on Sunday morning when this first goes on YouTube at 11 o'clock, I will remind you that following the service there is a Zoom chat that follows where you can pop in and say hello and and uh, get to know some of the people who are part of the congregation or, or just friends of the congregation. Coming up soon, as we notice the weather has certainly gotten colder, there is the Charity Walk, coldest night of the year, where donations uh, and money raised goes to the refuge here in Oshawa. Uh, Maureen and Joni will both be taking part, representing our congregation. Usually we have a much bigger turnout, but we'll have to have fewer people this year. We'll be posting information so you can support the refuge and also uh, support the two ladies that will be taking part on the congregation's behalf. Also, tomorrow will be February, which means I am now entering my third year of being minister here at St. Luke's. Uh, the first year was, was quite something, learning a lot of new stuff. The second year was also quite interesting. Uh, maybe the third year, we can make it slightly less interesting, if that's all right. But we'll see what the future is going to hold. And we continue on with our stay-at-home orders, uh, having more and more people participate in the worship service from home. So now let us begin our worship time as we enter into our time of worship with our call to worship. God's praise endures forever. And eternity meets us in fleeting moments. God's praise endures forever. And glory bursts into ordinary activities. God's praise endures forever. And faith is steadfast, even in the midst of change and challenge. Let us worship the eternal God who calls us to this time and place. Come, children, join to sing. Gracious God, we know that we receive so many blessings from you, things that we do take for granted, that we notice as the season has gotten even colder this time of year, we still find ourselves in places of warmth. Even though the, the world seems to be becoming more hostile, we know we have places to be where we're received, welcomed, and loved. We know that there are those around us that don't have these as blessings. We pray, Lord, that you do cause us to count each of them anyways for what we have. Simple things as something to eat, a place to be, 
someone to talk to. But the greatest blessing, Lord, is having you in our lives. Knowing that you saw it fit to reach down and pull us up and give us life. That you erased the sin debt that we carry. That you redeemed us. That you made us a new creation. We give you thanks, Lord. For it is all too often that we sin against you. Things that we say, things that we do, the ways we behave, the things we refrain from doing. Pray, Lord, that you continue to work within us to give us compassion, to keep us from the sin of being indifferent, to allow us to share your love with others. May you protect us this morning as we enter into worship. May you clear away all the distractions that the world puts before us. May we receive your word. May we use it correctly. May we hear it right. May you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray the words Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today's responsive reading is from Psalms 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The, the fear, fear of, of the Lord is, is the, the beginning, beginning of wisdom. wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. Let thy goodness like a better I 
A new prophet like Moses. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will cry it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak in my name, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And the second reading is Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Food offered to idols. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you, who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple will not be encouraged. And if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. And the third reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 21. Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. 
May God add his blessing to his reading, this reading of his holy word. The whole town was up in arms that the preacher accepted a large donation from the owner of the local tavern. Pastor, one church member spoke up. That money is from gambling and alcohol. It's from the devil. Don't take it. After calming everyone down, the pastor said, Well, the devil had his turn. Now we will see what the good Lord will do with it. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 8. Paul warns about the real struggle we encounter. Inward battles we may end up having with ourselves and whether things are going to be right or wrong. Things that we will regularly encounter on a Christian walk. And we will be stuck with the question, is this a big deal or is this a small deal? And we won't really know right away because everything is probably going to feel like a big deal. But on one hand, there will be items that won't be up for debate. Direct teachings of the faith. The doctrines, the things that we hold true, the, the things we have in our creeds. But other things are not as direct. There's, there's other things that we have that, that require us to rely on our conscience. Things that aren't spelt out for us in scripture. Sometimes they're referred to as adiaphora. Adiaphora, things that are neither considered moral or immoral, but it's up to us to have as a judgment call. Paul used the example of food and eating. Eating food is neither moral nor immoral, but it could seem that way. Food that was offered and sacrificed to false gods and other forms of pagan worship. They either ate it all up or burnt it all up, but if they didn't, it could appear on the market the next day, someone selling what was left over. And it could end up probably being cheaper than the other going rate. So would it be a sin to buy that meat and eat it? And Paul says, no. And yes. No, the meat does not have a demon attached to it. No, there is nothing inherently evil about that meat as it sits on a plate. It will not damage you spiritually to eat it. But yes, Yes, because if you are in the knowledge that you are deliberately causing a fellow believer in Christ that feels some attachment, maybe they came out of that pagan relationship, maybe they just have a conviction that there's something explicitly wrong with taking part of eating this meat. And he says, if it, if it is happening that way, then, then if that other believer in Christ feels like he or she is sinning and watching you do it, that not only is it a sin, says Paul, it is explicitly a sin against Christ to even cause that other believer to stumble. But we do have liberty. We have liberty and we have knowledge and we're warned to use both of those things carefully. That there are regular mundane tasks that we do day to day and we are not under this obligation, this pressure to worry that we might be under some form of, of unknowing rebellious sin as we do it. As we enter into the economy of the world, we would drive ourselves crazy if we were worried that every dollar that we spend, every interaction we make would have to be godly and right as we do it. As we go to get our oil changed, are we worried that the mechanic is a Christian and what he will do or she will do with that paycheck afterwards at the end of the day? Are we worried about the grocery store, but the clerk on the other side of the counter, the owner of the grocery store, and what that money is going to do afterwards? Are we concerned as, as we hand over money to our, our bills? We pay for gas, we pay for hydro, we pay for these things coming in. Are we worried about what the companies are doing with their money? Does it overly concern us that when casinos are, are taxed and, and that tax goes into our health care, and then we go to the hospital and receive healing from doctors for money that came in from all different sources. Not to mention the politicians that spend our tax dollars that we give to them. No, we're, we're told that we have a different form of liberty about that. You do have liberty. 
You can, you can do that with your purchases, though. You, you can boycott. You can decide not to buy from someone anymore. You can do that. You can do something that people call a boycott. You can choose to expressly give your money to one item or one, one type of business and buy exclusively from them to show your support. But that is, as Paul is spelling out for us, an area of liberty. That we're not to make a law where there is no law. The main point that Paul is impressing on us is very close to marriage advice. I still remember receiving one week before I was married. I, was, I remembered exactly where I was. It was at the Beaverton Legion. And I was talking to a man and he was a veteran. And as he heard I was getting married, he, he shook my hand and he pulled me in a little closer. And he took his other hand and he placed it upon my shoulder. And he gave me a few different tidbits of advice. And one really did stick. He said, when it comes to disagreements, you have two options. You can be right or you can be happy. You'll have to choose because you can't have both. I probably remember it because it was, it was funny. It seemed funny at the time. It's still a little funny now. But it's also probably funny because it has a bit of truth into it. And not far off from what Paul was teaching. Using the same principles in other places besides what we eat. When we have a disagreement and it's not a gospel issue, when it's not about sin, except for the fact that one person is convicted by conscience to put tighter restrictions on his or herself, to, to draw a, a smaller circle on what's allowable, not allowable. It's, it's not our part, it's not our job to come in and bulldoze those ideas over. Do we want to be right? Or do we want to be happy? Things that, that don't suit us. Things that we figure since it's not something we would be inclined to do, it's probably wrong, so we'll just advise someone else not to do it as well. Things that we will eventually gain through maturity. Things that we realize really aren't dividing lines. Things that separate the saved from the lost. Bible translations. Drinking alcohol, having wealth, tithing, music preferences. Here's a good one. The things we do in worship services. Clapping, instruments or no instruments, only singing a cappella, not singing hymns, only singing psalms. Now this one gets me though. Having a dry ice machine create billowing clouds in a worship service to waft over the congregation. I'll admit, that one's strange for me. But is it a dividing line? Can dry ice be used in a holy and righteous way? And is it just my, my initial off-the-cuff reaction that is really just the problem to it? I look at verse 8 in 1 Corinthians 8. And I wonder, what are the other things? Are there other things that I can swap in and out and read that sentence over and over? And could it still be true? Where it says, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Food does not bring us near to God. But what does? Music? Does music bring us near to God? Perhaps. It could. But is it the same one particular piece for each person, or would it be a different piece? Is someone maybe just not emotionally moved or, or drawn in spiritually by music at all? That could be the case. For me, I think getting in touch with creation. I love to go camping nearly every summer that we can. Because there's something about standing at the edge of the shore of water, having your toes touch sand, looking up at the stars at night, standing inside a forest, putting your hand up against nature. For me, I feel that that can bring me near to God. But that too, that's, that's subjective. That's not universal. That's probably not for everyone. So if food does not bring us near to God, then what does? I'll point us to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It's a good verse to remember. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. While there are many things that are preference, things that are subjective, this is the one objective universal truth of what brings us close to God. That the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel that tells us that God does not nor cannot just accept our, our best efforts to make up for our wrong. That our sins cannot simply be undone by goodwill. The same way a murderer doesn't get released by a judge because he happened to pick up garbage off the side of the street one day. Instead, the good news is that the impossible payment for the penalty of sin has been paid for by Christ for those who believe. Not long ago, I, I was reminded, I, I was talking about church membership with someone, and I was reminded of what it, what's required for a person to become a member of our congregation. We've done that at least once here in the last two years at St. Luke's. We've added not only members, but elders. And it, 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 I was reminded that the Presbyterian Church in Canada states in our book of forms, section 110, subsection 2, that the session can only require two things of a person to join our church and be considered a member. The first is to make a profession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God is known as Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the second thing that we require in order to be a member is to profess a desire to walk in God's way. That's it. We don't mention predestination. We don't mention the hypostatic union. We don't talk about all the ins and outs of doctrine. We ask for two things. Furthermore, it says the session may not require assent to any doctrine or special qualifications beyond this profession of faith so described and further expressed in the Apostles' Creed. We just ask a desire uh, to profess that you are willing to walk in God's way. Which means it's a walk, it's a journey, that there's going to be varying levels of progress and maturity all throughout. And this month, as I close my second year of ministry here and prepare to begin my third, I can attest that I have a lot of growing and maturing to do. I hope to do this for a few more decades. And it would depress me to know that at some point that I would just stagnate, that I would just hit a level and, and no longer continue on a journey along with my Lord. 1 Corinthians 8 is a reminder to not abuse our liberty. To not abuse it to something that will cause someone else to stumble. And I'm fairly certain I've done that already. I've probably been stubborn enough. Where it seemed more pleasing to be right than to be happy. More often than not, I've probably decided that an issue is a dividing line. When it probably wasn't. Instead, I want to do better. I want to see the church do better. I want to see fewer stumbling blocks and more fellowship. Let's come back to that. Take a moment, regroup. Realize who you are and where you are. When we are standing at the foot of the cross... Go back and look again. How big or how small does that issue now appear? Maybe it is worth going after. Maybe it's just small stuff. Let's, let's, let's focus less on the peripheral things that would separate us. 
and a resounding celebration for that which unifies us. The righteousness of Christ and his shed blood bestowed to undeserving sinners. Amen. And to God be the glory. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for all that we have, for all that we are able to do, for the things we have in our life. But Lord, we hold up to you those who are in need, those who are feeling like they are going without. We hold up to you those who are set aside in sickness, looking for healing, those in pain, looking for relief, those who are awaiting care, perhaps in a lineup, those who are preparing for surgery or recovering from one, those who need a calming nature to come upon them because there is too much worry going on about them right now. We uh, pray for your peace to be with others. For those who are still struggling with this time of a lockdown and a shutdown and staying at home, are worried with the future may bring, may they also have your peace. For those concerned about how to make ends meet, where revenues have now changed, work situations have changed, we pray, Lord, that your providence will be there. We hold up to you, Lord, those who are struggling with, with other inner emotions, other, other spiritual attacks, whether they are struggling with worry, with addiction, Lord, that we, we pray that that is held up to you as well. May we see healing be done in your name. May we see reconciliation be done in your name. May we see growth and prosperity happen in your name. May we see you sending us out to be hands and feet, to show the love of Christ to others around us, to share good news, that what happens in this world is not the only thing that defines us, but we prepare for a new world and a new creation. We thank you, Lord, for all that we have. May we continue to count our blessings. May we be able to, to move forward equipped and ready to do whatever it is you call us to do. Allow us, Lord, to, to continue to have servants' hearts and to be open to what you call us for. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. When the poor ones who have nothing share with strangers, when the thirsty
Then we know the obstacles that run with us. Then we know the obstacles that run with us. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.